Hey guys, thank you so much for tuning in for another episode. So in this episode, I'm going to be covering my maintenance routine for this giant 480 gallon discus tank. And um, a lot of people uh, ask me, you know, how I do it because this tank is four feet tall. So it does uh, pose some challenges. Some people shy away from tall aquariums because they think it's just too much of a pain in the butt to uh, make it work. But they did come up with some hacks uh, that make it easier and I want to cover them today. And I also want to tell you what else I do for my water changes. Because uh, when I do a water change, my water change preparation actually starts a week before I actually do the water change. And I wanna, I'm want i going to cover why that is. Um, I'm also going to cover um, what I do to make uh, transporting water in and out of the aquarium easier. Because we are talking about 200 gallons of water and I do water changes every week. So that's a lot of water and I don't want to carry that with buckets. So I did come up with some uh, hacks for that and I want to show you what those are and hopefully you will learn something. All right, so let's go over some of the tools that I use for my maintenance routine. And I want to start with this tool right here. So um, in the beginning, I almost decided not to buy my aquarium because I just thought it would be impossible to uh, clean the gravel or any substrate that I use until I found out that Python makes a gravel <laughs> vac like this that is actually four feet long. And uh, so because of this tool, I decided to buy this aquarium. Uh, it was basically what made my decision to actually go ahead with the purchase. And uh, fun fact is that I actually don't really use this anymore. And I'm gonna tell you why in a little bit. Um, but next, uh, the next tool I wanna talk about is this trash pickup tool. So this is a very, very valuable tool for me. And that is because uh, whenever I start my water change procedure, I actually use this in conjunction with a power head. And what I do is I grab the power head with my trash pickup tool and basically point it towards any area in the aquarium that is uh, uh, covered with algae or in the form of algae or the type of algae that I can actually lift off of the surface by using you know, a strong water current. And uh, so that works really well. So this is how it would look in action. I basically hold on to the power head with my trash pickup tool. And as you can see, the reach is pretty long and I can basically reach anywhere in the aquarium where I want. And I basically uh, want you to think of it as, uh, as if you are you know, trying to uh, broom a garage. So instead of grabbing a broom and a dustpan, it is much easier to just use a blower, like a leaf blower and blow the dirt away or point it towards any uh, pump in the aquarium. So that's basically what, I'm, what this kind of entails. So this is kind of my hack. Here you can see a really nice um, Amazon sword plant and I have some uh, Valisneri in the back. And so what do I do if I have to cut these plants? Um, here, for example, I have some Anubias XL, which I sometimes have to cut, you know, a dying leaf. So how do I do that? And basically, I'm using the trash pickup tool, again, in conjunction with my pair of scissors. So this is a regular pair of scissors uh, that you use in the aquarium hobby, a typical pair of scissors. Basically, I make sure that any stem I'm cutting is really close to the beginning of the a pair of scissors and you just cut it like this. Works really well <laughs> or good enough. But uh, yeah, that's basically how I reach anywhere deep in the tank where I need to cut something off. And uh, yeah, that has worked really well. So back to the uh, gravel. Um, as you may remember, I used to have some dwarf hagras everywhere, which was a real pain in the butt to keep clean because there was so much dirt getting trapped into uh, in between the tiny leaves of the dwarf hagras. And then I decided to switch everything over to these Anubias plants, and that has helped a lot. Um, I do see some algae here, which I would basically pick up with my trash pickup tool. But when it comes to the dirt and the leaf, um, I actually don't really have to do any siphoning. I'm only using my power head to stir up any dirt that I then point towards the pump that will uh, suck out the dirt. And uh, a reason for that is also these little tiny snails. Uh, these are trumpet snails. And uh, I used to have only like one or two, but then the population pretty much exploded and they're literally everywhere in the gravel. So what they do is they basically eat any leftover food from the discus fish. 
Uh, I never, uh, you know, found any leftover food from the uh, prior day of feeding. So these snails, they really take care of everything, uh, including fish that pass away. So the other day I found a bunch of snails on top of a, a fish carcass and uh, didn't really have to grab it out of the tank. They basically just ate it. And uh, these snails, they bury themselves into the uh, substrate, so that keeps it nice and aerated, and uh, basically turns the substrate over, which is really helpful. And uh, yeah, so uh, they don't eat my plants either. They're strictly carnivores, which is also really great. And uh, so far, I have no complaints at all. So my gravel looks totally clean, um, except for the algae, but there's no leftover pieces of food, so that's really good. Um, these snails, however, they do produce their own waste. I mean, they do pro uh, generate poop just like fish, and uh, that has to be uh, sucked out. And basically the way I do that is I have a utility pump, which has the strength of a quarter horsepower. And a quarter horsepower for this pump is equivalent to 2,200 gallons per hour. So basically what I do is I stick the pump into the aquarium, and. Uh, with the power head that I'm pointing towards anywhere in the background, I stir up all the dirt, and then that dirt gets sucked uh, through this pump into the toilet. So that makes it really easy, um, very little work actually, and uh, I just have to make sure that the power head doesn't get too close to any of the fish because the fins can get sucked into the power head and damage the fins, so that we don't want that to happen. But uh, that that method that I described pretty much uh, worked for me really, really well for the last couple of months. Makes water changes a lot easier. I have now begun the siphoning out of the water into the toilet. And uh, while this is going, I will start uh, picking up any of this algae that is, you know, big chunks uh, like up here, for example, or this I can pick up by hand in the background there. So because the opening of this utility pump is kind of small, you can't really see it here. So I don't want this to be blocked by algae. But uh, yeah, so instead of carrying buckets of water, this goes straight onto my toilet and uh, will be discarded that way. Okay, I've now turned on the power head and this is basically what I'm talking about moving it anywhere close to where I believe there's a bunch of dirt that has accumulated. And uh, yeah, make sure I don't get too close to the discus so it doesn't get into, the fins don't get sucked into the power head. But it works really well. It steers up a lot of dirt that uh, I would be missing. You know, similar to when you broom your garage, you use a leaf blower, you basically find every little piece that you would otherwise miss. So. Yeah, I think this is pretty, pretty successful way of uh, doing this. Um, wish I could be in the tank, but unfortunately I can't because of all the interior design, but this so far works really well. Here we can see nicely how the uh, power head is steering up all the dirt and the sump is basically sucking it out of the water and into the toilet and uh, Going at this rate, it only takes maybe 20 minutes to get half of the tank empty. And while the main display is uh, emptying out, I'm basically going to focus now on the sump. So what I do is I will grab a bucket and uh, take that to the bathroom and uh, grab each one of these uh, foam pads and uh, rinse them out in the aquarium water. And this uh, filter floss, I remove this usually every other day. And same with this uh, polishing material back there. And uh, then I will proceed to fishing out any um, fish or invertebrates that are stuck in the sump. And then uh, put everything back in. And that's pretty much it. Uh, maybe once a month I will rinse out the lava rock and the um, charcoal. But other than that, that's pretty much all the maintenance there is for the sump. So the dirty water is flowing out of the aquarium straight into the toilet. And here I have my sponges. And uh, as you may know in one of my previous videos, uh, these sponges have a different uh, coarse uh, number. Basically that means how um, fine the material is. The blue one has is the most coarse uh, and that means it's uh, targeted towards bigger pieces of dirt. 
And then the next one is a little finer in material, so it catches smaller pieces. And then the black one catches the finest pieces. So the black one takes the most time to clean. Uh, well, I probably have to do 10 rings and rinses uh, for this to keep this or make this relatively clean. These are a little easier. And then uh, once this is done, I will have to put them back into the sun as soon as possible because all three sponges are full with um, bacteria uh, attached to it, beneficial bacteria, and we don't want to keep it out of the water for too long, otherwise we will uh, lose them. So I'm gonna start going on that and then give you an update in a couple of minutes. All right, guys, so the fresh water is now filling into the tank. And uh, next I'm going to show you uh, what I actually do to prepare my water and how I actually uh, pump this into the tank and how I store the water as well. So this right here is a dream for anyone who has really large aquariums and needs to do large water changes. So this is called an IBC tote. And this one actually holds about 275 gallons. And uh, it comes with um, an opening valve down there, but I've had no luck whatsoever finding a pump that actually fits into the hole uh, until recently. So before I had to uh, use my other uh, Jibao pump and basically hook this up like this and then pump it from the top back into the water. But uh, this pump would always leak. So after months and months of searching, I finally found a pump that would actually fit through this hole of this IBC toad. So guys, this right here is the pump that I'm using. So this is the C a CK pump. And uh, I will put the link in the description. But this one is the only pump that I have found that fits into the opening of the IBC toad. So this is really great, a lifesaver, uh, compared to having to attach some external pump and dealing with leaks and stuff. Uh, the only downside to this pump is that it is a little weak. It has um, under a thousand gallons per hour compared to 2,200 uh, of the utility pump that I used to get the water out of the aquarium. So the fill up of this uh, uh, aquarium using this CK pump takes uh, twice as long as getting the water out. So that's the only downside. Uh, but other than that, I'm really happy that I found it. Um, another tip that I want to share with you is whenever I pump water in and out of the aquarium, I use a smart plug. And with that, I'm able to uh, control this pump um, through my app. So I don't have to constantly run uh, to this IBC tow to turn or unplug it or <laughs> do anything like that. So basically, in order for me to show you this pump, I had to turn it off, which I did through my app. So now I'm just going to turn it on. And it's now going to pump the water back into the aquarium. So that's what I do basically to get water in and out of the aquarium. And uh, now I want to talk to you about uh, preparing the water. So the discus fish, they need uh, water with really low pH and they also need uh, water that is 80 some degrees warm. So what I do here is once this is empty and the aquarium is filled up, I use uh, either tap water to fill this whole toad back up or I use the wastewater from my RDI unit because the wastewater actually has all the chlorine uh, stripped out of it already and it's perfectly safe to use it um, so if I use tap water what I do use is I use uh, Seachem safe to dechlorinate the water and then um, for the pH I use muriatic acid so this is something you find in your pool supply at uh, Lowe's or Home Depot and what I did was I basically used a measuring cup from like a protein powder and five of these is enough for this uh, toad that holds about 275 gallons but only uh, filled up to like here so like 250 gallons and so one scoop per 50 uh, gallons is fine and what this does is um, basically as soon as you put this uh, acid into the water it will first create a pH crash 
So the pH will go from my regular 8 point something or so that comes out of my tap to like 4. And then it will slowly go back up to about 6.5. And um, how far it goes up depends how much you put into it. But um, try to keep it at 6.5 for the discus, and five of these are enough to reach that level. Um, it's very, very important that you do this in preparation of a water change, uh, because animals will die if they go through this pH crash. And uh, in my case, um, I have some Corridora sturbis. They're very sensitive to this stuff, so waiting three days uh, was not long enough. I lost a bunch of corridors in the beginning. So uh, seven days is my sweet spot. So as soon as I'm done uh, with emptying this and filling up the aquarium, I will add a bunch of tap water and then put in the acid right away. So then seven days from now, I'm ready for my next water change. And that is basically why I told you in the beginning of the video that my water change, today's water change was actually prepared for seven days ago. Since the discus fish like their new water to be uh, the same temperature as the old one, which is around 80 degrees, or 80 be between 80 and 82, um, I use this titanium heater that I will put into that IBC toad, and then I will use a simple power head to steer the water up while it heats. And then for temperature control, I'm using uh, an Inkbird temperature controller. So in the winter, I will set this uh, to the desired temperature and let it heat overnight, uh, the night before the uh, water change. And in the summer, I actually don't need to use this because in Southern California, um, it gets so warm that I usually, I'm going to just put this whole toad outside and then the outside temperature will basically just keep it at the desired temperature level. A lot of people say that when you do 50% water changes or 75% water changes, you should add some um, beneficial bacteria. And uh, the bacteria actually doesn't live in the water itself. It attaches itself to the uh, interior. So uh, I still do add some bacteria and that's because uh, the background has a lot of bacteria attached to it and because this uh, CK pump is a little slow to pump the water back in, um, I do have some die off of um, bacteria and what I basically do is instead of dumping a bunch of bacteria in the day after uh, or the day off the water change, I basically feed it through my uh, feeding pump and through one of these chambers and I basically feed you know a little bit every day to uh, keep this whole uh, flora and fauna going. And uh, so far, this has worked really well to keep algae in check and um, prevent any you know, crashes. All right, guys, so it's been 24 hours since the water change and uh, everything looks great now. Um, it's actually not that bad uh, once you figure out how to deal with the height of this tank. Um, but I showed you some ways uh, that you can deal with this. And um, yeah, I mean, once you do, uh, found, once you have found your routine, it's actually really rewarding to have a tank this tall. It makes it look really, you know, uh, great. It really stands out. So it's a real showstopper. So uh, give you a last look at the fish. Um, here we have some rainbow fish. And then of course um, I have a beta so i always make sure i grab a beta from like PetSmart or petco and save them and put them in a nice big tank so that out of their small little you know bucket that they're usually in and then discus fish of course um got some corridoras they may be hard to see right there I have like 20 of those i have a uh, half banded spiny eel in here but he's hiding and uh you know a bunch of invertebrates but yeah um, if you have any questions or suggestions regarding uh, water changes in big tanks, let me know. I'm always willing to learn from other people who have big tanks or tall tanks like this. And if I come up with any other ideas uh, for the future, I will let you know uh, if it's worth an update video. Otherwise, I'll just post a comment in this video. But yeah, thank you so much for watching. I hope you uh, learned a little bit and then... Uh, Next, I will probably talk about uh, how to save money on a tank like this. So that's probably an interesting topic to cover. And uh, until then, thank you again, and I see you in the next video.